Hello everyone, uh, this is John Buck. I'm back with another array signal processing video. Uh, and in this video, we're going to talk about K omega beamforming uh, or broadband beamforming as it's sometimes called. So we're sort of widening our lens a little bit, moving away from the purely narrow band perspective we've had so far in this semester up till tonight. And we're going to think about what happens when our signal is still made out of plane waves coming from different angles, but what happens when those plane waves have different frequencies? How do we analyze an observed signal to find which frequencies and what, and which angles are present, and how do we interpret some of the plots for those? It, uh, it takes some time to do that. And there's sort of several layers to this. We're going to start in this first video just talking about the theoretical framework. Uh, then we'll have to talk about the fact that in any realistic system these days, our data is sampled in space by, for example, a uniform line array or, or perhaps some other array, but it's going to be measured at discrete family of locations in space. And it'll also generally be sampled in time with an analog to digital converter. So just sampling in space and time uh, has implications for what we can say about the uh, sp spectrum in both space and time. Uh, and then the next layer we'll talk about in class, which is the practical issues of how we compute these things. What happens when we can't compute them at every uh, angle, we can't compute every single angle or every wave number and every frequency. Uh, and so we'll talk about the computational issues with that in class. And then finally, if we have time, the last issue is to talk about the fact that because we have a finite uh, aperture in space and a finite duration of our observations in time, that has limits for our ability, our resolution. And we're going to have some smearing of things in both time and space that's related to the, well, the inverse of our aperture and the inverse of our duration interval. So let's start, though, with at the beginning with the theoretical framework, talk about how we're going to just add another layer going from narrowband signals to allowing frequency variation in our signal. So the idea behind K omega beam farming is we're still going to build our observed signal in terms of plane waves. And so for the signal measured in time at a location in 3D space for P, we'd say that and our general equation for a plane wave we saw back at the start of the semester is, is that I've got some amplitude and then I write it as a complex exponential. You do the J, and then I have omega t minus the uh, dot product of the vector k, the wave number vector, with the uh, location p. And then we've, we've been uh, simplifying this all semester. We're going to maintain this simplification if we, if we only observe the z-axis. Right, so our, our sensors all have the form where p is going to be zero on, on the first two axes and then some point in z, right, that this inner product simplifies, we can simplify the plane wave. And say this dot product just pulls out the z component of the wave number. So we'd say that x still is a time signal, but again, only observed on the z axis, still has some amplitude, and then I have the radian frequency omega times t, and then this dot product is simplified to be k sub z, just the, the z component of the wave vector times that location in space. And so the idea behind k omega beam forming is more generally we want to imagine that the signal we're observing on in time and on the z axis is a superposition of many plane waves. And so we're going to assume We're still using plane waves as our basis function, as it were. We're building the space-time field we're observing out of a, a combination of plane waves with different amplitudes, frequencies, and wave numbers. Right. So we're going to assume that the way we do that is we, we start with the plane wave, like we had here, and then we're going to assume each plane wave has a different amplitude as a function of frequency and wave number. And so for each plane wave, I weight it by, this is like our, our plane wave recipe. Each plane wave is an ingredient. This tells me how much of that frequency and wave number to put in to the dish. And I have one over, this should be two pi squared. I should have left myself some more room here. Let me clean this up the other way. I'll move the x of t back a little bit. Hang on just a sec. Okay, that's a little better. So we're saying our, our field in time and, and along the z-axis, we're, we're sort of to keep things simple, we're just going to worry about one axis, the z-axis for now. So still assuming we're dealing with linear arrays. 
These are just uh, normalization constants for bookkeeping. The real action is in here where we're saying I've got different plane waves with different omega and different kz, and as I integrate all across all possible omegas and kzs, each one has a different amplitude. I'm going to weight a different amplitude like this. And so our goal in k omega beam forming ultimately is to figure out uh, how much of each of these one appears. So this is like a, a more general version of a scanned response. So just to, because it's good to review, I want you to pause the video for a second here and, and try to remind yourself in one sentence, what is a scanned response? So a scanned response for a narrowband signal, like we've seen this semester, takes one array observation vector x, so the vector of complex phasors representing the signal at that narrowband frequency, and then we compute a spatial Fourier transform to find which plane waves are present in the observed data. Now, to compute that transform, often what we do is we create a filter bank with a bunch of beam formers, right? We might say I'm going to define a matrix of array weights that's going to be 1 over n times a whole bunch of CBF replica vectors, right? If I'm doing it in k space, I might say, well, I've got some k1. So each column of this would be a different k, the, the manifold vector for a different k, up to however many oops, however many v's I want, right? So this is, say, maybe my n beams, number of beams. Trying to write that a little cleaner. So the number of beams. So I have n different columns here, one for each beam. And so I can then say, well, my I can find the vector of how much energy is present for each of these plane waves when I take W Hermitian, this manifold, or this big matrix with all the conventional beam formers, and take the inner product with X. This is the narrowband version. What K omega beam forming do it is, does is it generalizes this. So, so a K omega plot, or K omega beam forming, generalizes the scanned response. So it essentially it is still a scanned response for both omega and, since we're using the z-axis, k sub z. And so our goal here is to plot, or to get a plot, where again we're generally interested in the energy or the power. So we want to know for each frequency and each wave number, what's the magnitude squared, or the, the energy present in that plane wave. That's the goal with the, the k-omega beam former. And so to do that, if, if we scroll back up here, we're trying to find this function in the middle. We need to take, basically, Fourier transforms in time and space, though with opposite signs, to cancel these out. So we can find this by taking the observed data in theory. The theoretical thing we're interested in is, is by, ob obtained by taking uh, sort of inverse Fourier transforms of both sides here. And so in theory, what we're looking for, actually I'll just start this on a new page. First, we, we've taken the Fourier transform with respect to time, right? This is the standard Fourier transform we've seen in our signal processing classes. And when we do this, this, this thing in the middle here, we can think of this as the Fourier transform of omega, but still z. So it's saying at each location and on the z-axis, what are the what's the uh, magnitude and phase for each frequency present, right? So we Fourier transform versus time, but not space. And then the next step is to do the Fourier transform like a Fourier transform, but with the opposite sign in the exponent in space. So that gives us another integral. So this is saying what what we're going to do is we're going to have now a Fourier transform against kz to do the uh, inverse, and so when we plug these in, all the, the omega and, and kz's have the opposite sign in the equation I showed on the previous page. And so by integrating across time, Fourier transforming against time, and then against space, we're left with this x of omega k. And so it's, it's worth pointing out for the uh, by construction, if I want to, for a single plane wave, I would want something that has for a single narrow band plane wave. I 
what I would want is I, I, I end up saying that I want something that is present at only one frequency. Well, that would be an impulse. So this would be this would put the spectrum just at omega naught. And then we'd say, well, I also want just one wave number. And then to get the amplitude A, if I want the same amplitude, I need to put a couple, this is all just bookkeeping, uh, a couple k A times 2 pi squared. So when I plug these in to the synthesis equation I had back here, right, the impulse would work for each integral, would work the same way. It would pull out just one value, so I get omega naught and k naught here, and I'd be left with a single plane wave in this form for omega naught and k naught. And so any single narrow band, single bearing plane wave just will show up as a dot when I make this picture. Uh, but I think what we'll do now is, well, this is like the big picture theoretical overview. It's saying, well, in theory, in a perfect world, if we had continuous time and the whole z-axis, this is what we do. Uh, I'm going to stop this part here, and in the next video, we'll pick up the story with saying, well, what do we do in practice when uh, I've got uh, a finite array sampling at locations, and uh, I also have, uh, I'm sampling the data in time. All right, so I'll, I'll stop here for now. Uh, but the big picture, again, to keep in mind, if you remember one thing about uh, k omega beam forming from this video, is that the scanned response is like a broadband, or sorry, the k omega beam form is like a, a broadband version of the scanned response. We're trying to look at an observed signal in time and space and take it apart and say how much plane, you know, which frequencies are present in it and which plane wave directions are, are present in it. And we use that sort of as our recipe to, to take it apart. Okay, see you next time.